Well, hello everybody. Welcome again, and uh, to all the dads and granddads and fathers in the faith out there, happy Father's Day. Have a great one. I hope you've been thoroughly spoilt already. There, the story goes, there was um, a pious man who'd reached the age of 105, and he suddenly stopped going to the synagogue. Alarmed by the old fellow's absence after so many years of faithful attendance, the rabbi went to see him. He found him in excellent health. So the rabbi asked, how come after all these years we don't see you at services anymore? Well, the old man, he looked around and he lowered his voice and he says, I'll tell you, rabbi, when I got to be 90, I expected God to take me any day. But then I got to be 95 and then 100 and then 105. And so I figured that God is very busy and must have forgotten about me. And I don't want to remind him. The storms of life and avoiding them, particularly the ultimate storm of death, preoccupies most of us at some time or other, I guess. And the Bible passage we're about to look at, uh, which is the one about Jesus calming the storm, it's, it's been used a lot during this time of coronavirus lockdown. It, it's an account of friends and expectations within friendship. We don't expect that much from strangers, but we usually have high expectations of how our friends, especially close friends, should behave towards us. It is painful to think a close friend or someone we trust has let us down, even more so when that friend is Jesus. Where is God in the storm, the storms of life? Let's read together from Mark's Gospel, um, and it's in chapter 4, and we're going to read verses uh, 35 to 41 together. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Well, last week we listened as Jesus sat in a small fishing boat just off the shore and taught crowds of people standing nearby on the beach. That was right at the beginning of this chapter, Mark 4. Today, we pick up the story towards the end of Mark 4 as Jesus finishes speaking to those crowds. It's been a long day, evening closes in, the fishermen turn disciples and Jesus decide to sail to the other side of Lake Galilee. Remember when we introduced Mark's Gospel some weeks ago, we reminded ourselves that these are Peter's accounts of Jesus that Mark recorded. This passage is full of wonderful little details that support an eyewitness recalling the scene. It tells us of the time of day, evening is coming on. They take Jesus just as he was. There were other boats nearby. There's the detail of a cushion in the stern of the boat, and there is the memory of terror and bewilderment. And there is also an exchange of strong words that Peter will never forget. At this point, we're not told why Jesus chooses to sail to the other side of the lake. Um, we'll look at that a little bit more next week. But it seems they waste no time. They don't go ashore when the preaching on the beach finishes. They simply set off in the boat. 
Now, the Sea of Galilee is notorious for storms. If you visited, you'll know that it sits in a basin surrounded by mountains and is susceptible to rapid changes of air temperature that cause sudden, violent, in this case, furious storms. Jesus, probably tired from a long day of teaching, makes the most of the opportunity to sleep on the little seat and the cushion in the stern of the boat. It's a picture of peace and calm. And interestingly, this is the only specific mention in the New Testament of Jesus asleep. And the image is in marked contrast to the gathering violence of the coming storm. As the storm reaches its peak, the disciples are far from relaxed. These are experienced fishermen. This is their world. On the water, they are the experts. They understand storms. And if they, the experts, genuinely believe that they are about to sink and drown, we'd suppose that they have every right to presume Jesus will accept their judgment of the seriousness of the situation and believe them. They are panicking. Yet to them, Jesus being asleep just suggests their fear and judgment of the storm are unimportant to him. What's the matter with this guy? Why is he not engaging? Can't he see the danger? Can't he sense our concern? We can feel all of that fight or flight adrenaline kicking in as the disciples recognize the sudden danger that's come upon them. Distressed, angry even, certainly with an urgency, the disciples wake Jesus with these words, teacher, don't you care? Don't you care if we drown? And actually, and please remember, these are fishermen at their wits end thinking they're about to die. And in the original Greek, it's graphically direct, rude actually. The language is rough and indignant. There is real challenge and criticism here. Both Luke and Matthew, they tone down the language and the words in their version. This lack of respect brought on by genuine terror makes the point the disciples don't yet understand who Jesus really is. If they had, they would not have spoken in this way. Jesus wakes and rises. He rebukes the wind and he commands the waves, quiet, be still. And the wind died down and it was completely calm. It is a dramatic contrast. The sense of the language is a great storm is countered by a great calm. If you have the time, it's worth you looking up Mark chapter 1, verses 25 to 27 later on. Compare this storm incident with how Jesus rebuked an unclean spirit, and you will see the language is the same. The way Jesus treats the storm parallels the way he treats rebellious powers. It's almost as though there is a malevolence behind the storm that is exercised. Often the sea in ancient writings symbolised the power of chaos and evil. Jesus calms the storm and then he turns to his disciples. I'm not quite sure what they were expecting in this moment of huge relief as the danger subsided. You can picture them kind of sighing with relief, wiping their faces, sitting down for, for a quiet moment, but I don't think they expected this. Jesus rebukes them, tells them off big style. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? In other words, why are you so cowardly? Don't you have faith yet? It is firm. It is direct. The language really says, you faithless cowards. And these are strong words from Jesus to his friends. No wonder Peter remembered them. And it is to Peter's credit 
that they are included in Mark's gospel. We sense Jesus is exasperated. By now the disciples should know better. Why do they not believe when they have seen the things they've seen and heard what they have heard? Faith is lacking, fear overwhelms them, and the episode reveals that Jesus had by this time expected them to demonstrate more mature faith. Faith in God's saving power, present and active in the person of Jesus. What we might think is this just a tit-for-tat exchange. Hard words from Jesus in response to harsh words by the disciples, a spat between friends under the strain of a difficult day, difficult circumstances. No, I don't believe so. Verse 41 goes on and says, they, the disciples, were terrified. It describes the feeling of awe that crept up and overcame the disciples as the realisation of what Jesus had done dawned on them. The revelation to them of his authority. We can almost hear the cogs turning and see the shocked expressions on their faces as they think and process and ask each other, who is this? Really, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And the implied answer is he is the strong the authoritative Son of God. Only God the Creator, the one who made all this, who spoke the world and life into being, has the power, the authority to command creation in this way. God is in the boat with us. And their shock their awe, their reverence in the light of this revelation is tangible as they acknowledge divine power at work in Jesus. You might want to check out Colossians 1 verses 16 and 17. It says, for in him, in Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. It is not difficult to imagine the effect of this story on the members of the persecuted church in Rome that Mark wrote his gospel for. Or perhaps during those times of famine and plague endured by the early church, this story of the strong Son of God who would go with believers into the storms of opposition and trial. There are mutual expectations within friendships, especially close friendships. Don't you care? Expresses a sense of hurt, even neglect. Jesus doesn't seem to be fulfilling his part of the friendship. When they need him, to their mind, he appears far away. He's asleep, disengaged, detached from their needs and their feelings. Many of you will remember the popular 90s TV series Friends, which is experiencing a bit of a resurgence in popularity at the moment. You can probably even hum the theme tune, I'll be there for you. That's the line of the chorus, the refrain that keeps cropping up, I'll be there for you. For the disciples, Jesus seems to be ignoring the most important rule of friendship, to be there, fully engaged when needed. But in fact, it turns out, as we follow this little story, that it is they, the disciples, that have misunderstood him. And it is they who are not fully there for him, in the sense they have simply not yet grasped who he is, despite everything that they've witnessed. Their frustration and questions 
they're misplaced as they realize Jesus has absolute authority over their situation, indeed every situation, and is more than capable of saving them. They and we must learn to trust him completely. Now, of course, we know that Jesus went on to die on the cross, a substitute to atone for the wrongdoings of the world, that he rose from the grave, ascended to heaven, making, modelling and evidencing a new and living way for not just those disciples in the boat, but for all who trust him as Lord. Jesus has all the power, all the authority and all the love. He is there for us, even if we don't always recognise what he's doing. The disciples simply did not grasp Jesus' capacity to support them and stand by them in ways beyond their understanding. And we often do the same. Where is God, we ask? Jesus will continue to incrementally stretch the faith and trust of the disciples, as we'll see later in Mark's Gospel. And he will do the same for us. He loves us too much to leave us as we are. He will deliver us from all sorts of trials and challenges and situations. He may even deliver some of us from death. And eventually, hopefully, at the ripe old age of 105, he will deliver us through death. Put your trust in Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for, for this account, for this episode that we've looked at in the life of the disciples, in the life of Jesus. And we thank you that we discover that Jesus is for us and he's in control in a way that goes beyond our understanding. Father, we pray for ourselves that you will increase our faith, that you will give us total and absolute trust in the sovereignty of God and know that Jesus is for us, interceding for us, looking out for us, and that whatever situation we face, he understands and is supporting us, even though we don't necessarily understand how. Increase our faith, we pray, as we follow our Lord and our Saviour. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.